Today is Thursday, February 7th. We're talking about the accusations against the top three government officials in Virginia and why top food delivery companies are now apologizing. Plus, Spotify bets big on podcasts and a smartphone that charges your headphones? Maybe. Then hang out after the news for Thing to Know Thursday's bonus interview, hear from a Grammy winner ahead of this weekend's award show, and her message about music. Welcome, welcome to The Newsworthy. All the day's news in less than 10 minutes. Fast, fair, fun, and on the go. I'm Erica Mandy. Thanks so much for being here. You ready? Let's do this. The House Intelligence Committee is reopening an investigation into Russia's interference in the 2016 election. The AP reports they'll be looking at President Trump's finances to see if there are any foreign ties. Republicans closed this investigation last year, but now the Democrats are back in charge in the House. They say this isn't over. This is different than the special counsel's ongoing Russia investigation. In fact, The Washington Post says lawmakers also voted to send special counsel Robert Mueller more than 50 witness transcripts so he can see if anyone lied under oath. Remember, Mueller already charged President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, for lying. And now the House committee won't be hearing from him again until later this month. Cohen was supposed to testify in public this week, but then he said he got threats from President Trump and backed out. Then it was supposed to happen behind closed doors. Well, now it's been postponed. ABC News reports Cohen will testify February 28th. He's then set to go to prison in March. Another top Democrat from Virginia is admitting he wore blackface. First the governor did, now the attorney general. The New York Times reports Attorney General Mark Herring, who is third in line to become governor, admitted to painting his face in 1980 when he was in college. He's now apologizing, and he said it was a one-time thing. But this is the second apology for this from a Virginia politician this week. Remember, Governor Ralph Northam also apologized after he admitted to painting his face black in the 80s. And there's more. Now a third Virginia lawmaker is also facing accusations. Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax was accused of sexually assaulting a woman 15 years ago. He says he didn't do it. If all three men were to resign, the Republican House Speaker, Kirk Cox, would step in as governor. For now, Governor Northam, who's a Democrat, is refusing to resign. Although Attorney General Herring might. To be continued. Oh, and it's not just politicians starting to think about their potentially scandalous past. The Wall Street Journal says high-profile executives are being told to do so-called opposition analyses on themselves. President Trump's nomination to head the World Bank is a longtime critic of the bank itself. NPR reports Trump nominated Treasury Department official David Malpass for president of the World Bank, but he's known for criticizing the way it operates. Malpass has worked on trade negotiations with China and has overseen the government's relationship with the World Bank. If he gets the top job, Malpass would replace Jim Yong King, who announced his resignation in January. Trump calls Malpass an extraordinary man, but critics say they're worried about his lack of experience. It's not final yet, though. Malpass still needs to be approved by the countries that control the World Bank to get the job. Stay tuned. A new report shows 2018 was the fourth hottest year on record. NASA says Earth's temperature during 2018 was almost two degrees above the average, which makes it one of the hottest years in 140 years. NBC News reports the last five years have actually been the warmest in recorded history. And NASA says global warming is not only happening now, it's showing no signs of slowing or stopping. So 2019 is expected to be the second warmest year on record. More news still ahead, but a quick break today to tell you about today's sponsor, Everyday Einstein. Have you listened to this yet? Everyday Einstein is another podcast that is full of quick stories to help you understand the world better. The host, Dr. Sabrina Steerwalt, is an astrophysicist with a PhD from Cornell who loves explaining science in terms anyone can understand. Turns out science news can actually be fun. With Everyday Einstein, you can learn what's going on in the world of science in just 8 to 10 minutes a week. Hear answers to questions like, is climate change really responsible for extreme weather like floods and wildfires and why? And fun stories like whether double-dipping chips and salsa is actually scientifically gross. So check it out and subscribe to Everyday Einstein wherever you listen to podcasts. That's Everyday Einstein. Now, back to the news. The most popular app for delivering groceries is now having to apologize to its workers. Recode reports Instacart is now changing its tipping policies. Workers and customers started posting screenshots of receipts online, showing the company seemed to be cheating workers out of tip money counting tips toward their minimum wage pay instead of adding it on as extra. 
Recode says the company first denied it, but eventually gave in. And it isn't just Instacart. Other gig economy companies, like food delivery company DoorDash, have also been accused of something similar. Spotify is making big moves and investing in podcasts. Reuters reports Spotify, which is the world's biggest music streaming company, is now trying to make an even bigger name for itself in other types of audio, spending millions on two podcast networks, Gimlet and Anchor. TechCrunch says Spotify paid more than $200 million for Gimlet, which is known for popular podcasts like Reply All and Startup. And Anchor is an app that helps users make podcasts. And this is just the beginning. The Wall Street Journal says Spotify plans to spend $500 million on other deals this year. A leaked picture may have given us a sneak peek into Samsung's new earbuds. The Verge says the photo shows wireless earbuds sitting on the back of the new Galaxy S10 phone, which could mean the phone might be able to charge earbuds. Or the positioning is just a coincidence, we're not sure yet. But it is rumored the new S10 can wirelessly charge other devices. Again, none of this is confirmed, but we'll find out soon. Samsung is set to reveal the new phone this month. Ariana Grande has decided she will not perform at the Grammys, and now she says she's not even going. Variety says the pop singer decided not to go after a disagreement with Grammy producers on what songs she could perform. Grande says she felt insulted when they said she could not sing her new single, Seven Rings. The Grammys have not said anything about Grande pulling out, but they have added more artists to the lineup. Billboard says artists like Lady Gaga and Travis Scott were added to the list. The Grammys are this Sunday, February 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern on CBS. And that's it for the main news today, but it's now time for Thing to Know Thursday, where a different expert explains a different thing to know only on Thursdays after the news. This week, ahead of the Grammys this Sunday, we're talking to a woman who started a music program in a school system where 22% of the students are homeless. And now she has a Grammy herself. Melissa Salguero is the 2018 Grammy Music Educator Award winner. You may have seen her appear on last year's Grammys. And she's also a finalist for the 2019 Global Teacher Prize, where she could win a million dollars for her work. We're talking about what it was like to be at the Grammys and the importance of music in the classroom. So here's my conversation with Melissa Salguero. Hi, Melissa. Thanks so much for coming on The Newsworthy. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited about this. Well, first of all, congratulations again on getting such a huge and well-deserved honor. I mean, a Grammy last year. Now you're a finalist for the Global Teacher Prize this year, which, by the way, the award is a million dollars. It's with- kind of crazy, isn't it? Uh, but, it, it, you know, I am very passionate about education and music education. And I want to get more into that. But first, I, I have to hear a little bit about the experience winning a Grammy. We saw you on the Grammys last year on television. Uh, when did you first learn that you were a finalist and then the winner? And what was that experience like? Oh, it was a nail biting experience uh, because they they uh, they narrow it down little by little. And um, I had been in the quarter finalist for a few years. And when I finally made it to the top 25, I was like blown away because after reading about all of the um, the semifinalists, I'm, I'm just like, I'm in shock. Then from the top 25, they narrow it down to top 10. And at that point, I was in absolute disbelief. And then came the uh, the most amazing phone call of my life was when uh, Neil Portnell gave me a call, and uh, you know he let me know that I was the winner. And um, there are no words to describe what that feeling is. It, it was a validation of everything that I've been working up to in my career, and 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 it was a validation more so for my students because they saw you know, their little neighborhood in the South Bronx of Hunts Point on a national level, which it, it, it just, it blew their mind that they were going to see their music teacher on the Grammys. And it probably made music so much more important to them to see that it's recognized in that way, which is amazing. What was it like to actually be at the Grammys? Oh, the Grammys, uh, that was a night to remember for sure. All of the Grammy events, were it was like a week. So it was like event after event after event. And then finally it ended with the Grammys. So it was so surreal to actually walk the red carpet. Like I'm just a teacher. I just teach music and I'm, uh, you know, walking down. And then I see like my childhood idol, Lisa Loeb, is, is like right there next to me doing an interview. And I was like freaking out, but it was... <laughs> 
<laughs> it was the coolest thing. And it, it, it still blows my mind, the experience I had. One of the reasons you're getting all of these awards is that you started a music program in the Bronx in an area where 22 percent of the students are homeless. So why was this so important to you to do? For me, growing up, music, it it saved my life. And music education completely changed the way that I thought about my schooling. And I had a lot of difficulties um, when I was growing up. I had I. I'm dyslexic, you know, and so, you know, numbers and reading really didn't come naturally to me. Um, But you know what? When I picked up a trombone for the first time, uh, like all of that disappeared. And I really, truly experienced what success was and working hard. And it really saved my life. So I wanted to give that gift to others. Uh, And that's why I chose music to be a teacher. Um, It absolutely makes my students feel that sense of I'm working so hard towards something, I can achieve this goal. And what seems impossible at first, then they achieve that goal. And then they're like, I'm unstoppable. And these are the outcomes of music programs all over the United States, not just my program. So when I started in the room, it was an empty room with me and a guitar. I had no idea how I was going to build a program but I really leveraged a lot of help. I was not shy to reach out to people and and just ask. So I I gathered my resources. I applied for every single grant I could. I to date it's it's over two hundred thousand dollars that I've brought into the school to help support the music program. And that's why like the Grammy Music Educator Award was so amazing because they gave the school ten thousand dollars for for winning this award and that is life-changing. That is the difference between, you know, having music stands or like reading pieces of paper on the floor in in some schools. You know, I'm finally at a point where I have an abundance of resources that now I'm starting to reach out into the community and the other schools in the area and see what they need and see how our students can help them leverage our, you know, exposure to get them the resources they need and really help lift everyone up. So speaking of funding, are you concerned about the lack of funding and where does that stand around the country? Absolutely. You know, music and the arts, I argue that it needs to be a right of every single student in every single school in every single state in America to have a music program. And what I've done in the South Bronx, I've proven that, you know what, money isn't an obstacle for us anymore. I operate on a zero dollar budget because I've applied for grants and everything, but that's not what teachers should have to do. Teachers need resources to be able to reach the kids especially in schools like mine, where you're dealing with a very, very high rate of poverty in the area, you know, there needs to be kind of an overhaul in the way we think about music and the arts, because they touch a part of humanity that, you know, math and reading and science, it's different. Music really speaks to our soul. And what I've learned that my students take away from my class is how to be a team, how to how to have that unity and that uh, sense of community inside of a, a school. My program is bringing the kids to the school and we absolutely need to support programs like that all over America. And you can learn more about today's guests in today's show notes. That's where you'll also find links to all the stories we talked about in this episode. Go to thenewsworthy.com, click episodes, and look for today's date. Thank you so much for listening today. And as always, The Newsworthy is ready for you by 4 in the morning Eastern time every weekday. We'll chat again tomorrow. Have a great day. 